So let's start out with a little thought experiment. So imagine you're living in a pre-scientific world. So you might be a Neanderthal or an early Homo sapien lying out under the stars somewhere, and you have a dream. What would you make of that? What would you make of going and seeing all these strange places, maybe some you've never been, maybe seeing people that are long dead? How would you try to make sense of these things if you didn't have uh, science to help you on that? Well, some people have speculated that these events, like dreams, have led to a lot of interesting human experiences, belief in a soul, belief in religious experiences. So the eminent British philosopher Thomas Hobbes had this to say, from this ignorance of how to distinguish dreams and other strong fancies from vision and sense did arise the greatest part of the religion of the Gentiles in time past that worships satyrs, fauns, nymphs, and the like. And nowadays, the opinion that rude people have of fairies, ghosts, and goblins and of the power of witches. So let's talk a little bit about some of the things that might happen if you're not aware of dreams as dreams. You would get something like oneromancy, which is very much like augury, but instead of trying to read bird signs, you use dreams to try to predict the future or divine the will of the gods. There's a long history of using dreams for personal prophecy. So Hannibal used to make some of his battle strategies based on his dreams. And our world today would be very different if Hitler wouldn't have given credence to one of his dreams. When he was in the trenches of World War I, he awoke up to a dream of being covered in dirt and just suffocating under dirt. And as soon as he got up and, had this, and realized he had a dream, he left the trench. And shortly thereafter, a mortar shell came and killed everybody in the trench. So unfortunately, he paid attention to that dream. You also might get beliefs in soul travel, astral projection, things like this are very consistent with dream experiences. And just in general, with our dreams we have a world of spirituality, magic, um, and we see so many strange things. So if normal sleep can be this provocative, how much more provocative would be when you have really strange things happening? And we're going to talk about one of those today. I'll be talking about the nightmare. We would call this today sleep paralysis, but I'll get to that in a minute. So nightmare, little n, that's the kind of word for us, the, our understanding of the nightmare, is really just a scary dream. You know, we uh, wake up in a start, and we quickly realize, oh, that was just a dream, and then I can go, go about my day, I might, you know, tell my girlfriend what it was, but it's not that impressive, not really that scary. This really seems to be a 20th century invention. I haven't quite been able to pinpoint when this semantic shift happened, but it does seem to have just happened in the past 100 years. The original nightmare, which I'll use with a big N, was vastly different and is very consistent with what I'll talk about as sleep paralysis. The original nightmare was far scarier. So words like fear and anxiety don't really do it justice. Um, angst would be a better word because it kind of has this idea that we've got a threat to the core of our being going on with this. It was riddled with supernatural attributions. We'll spend a lot of time talking about those today. Some of those are pretty fun. Um, it was also seen as potentially contagious. You have Roman writers who are talking about people having nightmares and by talking about their nightmare experiences with other people, other people got it. So you have these stories of it just burning through Rome like a plague. And it was also seen as potentially deadly. So you would have this bizarre sleep experience, and there was real speculation that it could actually kill you. So our nightmare with a small n is really just a weak, anemic little shadow of what we would call the original nightmare. And I'm going to give you guys a first-hand account of this from a medical doctor named Robert McNish, who himself was a sufferer. They are a thousand times more frightful than the visions conjured up by necromancy or diablerie and far transcend everything in history or romance. From the fable of the writhing and aspen circle Laocoon to Dante's appalling vision of Ugolino and his famished offspring, or the hidden tortures of the Spanish Inquisition. And as we all know, nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> the whole mind during the paroxysm is wrought up to a pitch of unutterable despair. A spell is laid upon the faculties which freezes them into an action. And the wretched victim feels as if pen alive in his coffin, or overpowered by resistless and unmitigable pressure. Everything horrible, disgusting, or terrific in the physical or moral world is brought before him in fearful array. He is hissed at by serpents, 
tortured by demons, stunned by the hollow voices and cold touch of apparitions. Clearly, this is not a scary dream. And man, do I wish my graduate students could all write like this. <laughs> so we're going to talk a little bit about um, sleep paralysis, contemporary medicine, before we get into the mythology of it. Here's a still from Rodney Asher's great film, The Nightmare, which if you haven't seen, you really should. <clears throat> so what is sleep paralysis? In a nutshell, what happens is you're either going to sleep or you're waking up and you find yourself completely unable to move except for your eyes. It's not just that movement feels hard or difficult, that you're sluggish. You are paralyzed except for your eyes. So you can move your eyes. You have some control over your respiration. Um, and what's weird is you're conscious during this. So you have what we would call a clear sensorium during these events. And you may or may not have dreams occurring while you're awake or hallucinations. So you're paralyzed. Eyes can move around the room. You're having hallucinations. And you're awake. If it's not associated with any other medical conditions like narcolepsy, people with narcolepsy get sleep paralysis quite a bit. It's actually part of the narcoleptic tetrad of symptoms or hypokalemia. But if you get it and you don't have one of these medical conditions, it's called isolated sleep paralysis, meaning it's isolated from other medical conditions. And recurrent isolated sleep paralysis is a recognized medical diagnosis in the International Classification of Sleep Disorders. Um, and I'll just take you briefly through the criteria here. You have to have multiple episodes of sleep paralysis. Unfortunately, it doesn't say how many or over what time period. It's not operationalized. The episodes have to cause some sort of clinically significant distress. So some people find themselves not wanting to go to sleep, like in the old Nightmare on Elm Street movies. They try to stay awake. Or they might avoid the bedroom or the accoutrements of sleep. It also can't be better explained by a medical condition or substances. You're much more likely to have sleep paralysis when you use alcohol. And I can talk a little bit about that later. <coughs> Uh, myself and other scientists have proposed other thresholds that are a bit more specific so we can do more rigorous scientific research. All right, so you might be wondering what causes this? What causes these strange experiences that are so riddled with fear? Throughout most of recorded history, people thought something supernatural was happening. So they believed it was an actual attack by some malevolent entity. They believed it was obsession, which means attack from without, <laughs> as opposed to possession, which means an attack from within. Now, there were some reasonable skeptical people, though, to be fair, um, that didn't believe that it was caused by supernatural entities. And they thought it was due to such things as having too much blood. So if you believe in the humoral theory of disease, you know, the key is balance. So if you have too much blood, you end up getting sleep paralysis or the nightmare. Some people thought it was due to gastric disturbances. So if you ate too many chestnuts, or if you ate alligator pears, or what we would today call avocados, you were likely to get sleep paralysis. Other people speculated that having an acidic or basic pH in your body could cause it, and they would make treatments accordingly. Some people thought different lunar phases could bring on these episodes, almost like werewolves. Probably my favorite ones are the degeneracy theories. So if you were lazy, gluttonous, drank a lot, masturbated too much, you'd get sleep paralysis. And there was a long-standing connection with female sexuality and menstruation and sleep paralysis. Um, now, all of these things that I've told you, there doesn't seem to be any data behind them. This last one I'm going to tell you actually does. Pregnancy. Sleep paralysis is the only parasomnia that we know of that actually increases as women get ad more advanced in their pregnancies. The other ones go down or completely go away. So there's a bit of data on that. And in terms of contemporary understandings, we have a good sense of what's going on. In a nutshell, what's going on is you are awake while having two aspects of rapid eye movement sleep. So during rapid eye movement sleep, um, you are paralyzed, presumably so that we don't act out our dreams, because this would be pretty dangerous, especially for someone sleeping next to you, right? So you're paralyzed, and you also have all those interesting dreams going on. But in contrast to REM sleep, you're having them while you're awake. Okay? And we actually have identified, um, a, co a colleague at University of Sheffield identified that there is a genetic contribution to this. And we've even identified the specific neurotransmitters that are involved in the motor inhibition that happens, GABA and glycine. But I doubt you want to hear me talk about neurotransmitters for the rest of the talk. So we'll talk about some of the interesting historical and cultural implications of this phenomenon. 
So here you see uh, probably the most famous visual representation of the nightmare. It's called The Nightmare by Henri Fuseli. And it's got a lot of the core elements. You've got a paralyzed person, a malevolent demon on top. And you've even got the horse connection. So nightmare, mare, horse. So what, one of the things that I find most fascinating about sleep paralysis, the nightmare, is that it seems to occur in every single culture. The core features really don't change. But what does change is what you make of them. The specific things that are seen, the particular attributions seem to be unique to cultures. And I'll give you some examples of those in a minute. Um, medical descriptions go back really far. There are some from Hippocrates that seem close, but the first medical description I was able to locate that had all the elements of sleep paralysis goes back to 7th century AD in Paulus Algonita, who is a Byzantine Greek physician. He's the first one to really talk about it, and he's also who talked about those contagious episodes of the nightmare. We only named it sleep paralysis in 1928. It had went by other names like the nightmare and things like that. And I'm going to make the claim, and I'm going to be careful here, I'm not saying that all the mythological things we're going to be talking about today were caused by sleep paralysis. I'm making a much smaller claim that it's a little bit of a piece of the puzzle. It's a contributing factor to these beliefs. And some of the ones we know really well in the West are demons. Anybody know where I got this from? What movie? Exorcist. The Exorcist. Now, bonus question, what's the name of the demon? Pazuzu. Pazuzu. You, get a, you get two gold stars, awesome. <laughs> So we got demons, vampires. <laughs> vampires are related to sleep paralysis. Oh, I can't stand Twilight. <laughs> witches. Probably of all the supernatural entities, there's the closest connection to sleep paralysis and witches, with or without flying blue monkeys. But personally, I like <laughs> flying blue monkeys. Alien abductions. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, this is actually a lamp. They only make it in Australia. I've been trying to get one for years. Um, maybe if I'm good this year for my birthday, my girlfriend will get me one. We'll see. <laughs> but, but I think that's fantastic. That would look so good on my desk. But alien abduction, there's a strong connection. We actually have some data on this, that it's connected with sleep paralysis. Fairies. Here's a picture of the Cottingley fairies, um, which th these pictures were taken of children up very close to Leeds in the UK. Fairies used to abduct people. We don't know much about it today, but they're very similar to the alien abduction stories and also seemingly related to sleep paralysis. Ghosts. And who wouldn't want to be haunted by these guys, right? <laughs> but think about the ghost stories you know about. They often occur in the bed. They often in involve being paralyzed, not being able to move, possibly from fright, possibly from other reasons. This is a new one. For me, I really only became aware of shadow people as I started doing research. Um, we'll talk more about um, these in a bit, but they seem, this seems to represent a little bit of a shift in the narrative of how contemporary Americans and Europeans are experiencing sleep paralysis these days, and I'll present a little bit of data on that. So, you, that was uh, some examples in the West. Um, you might be wondering about how sleep paralysis is experienced in other cultures. So, uh, myself and a colleague were able to identify 118 different terms for sleep paralysis across time and place. So, if you were in Japan, you would call the experience kanashibari, which means to be bound or fastened by strips of metal. So, you're stuck in the bed, bound or fastened by metal. Then you've got the popabawa. Popa Bawa was this giant black bat that would come out of the jungles of Zanzibar, lay on top of you, and sexually assault you. In Germany, they call it the Hexendrucken, or witches pressing. Um, if you were in Turkey, they'd call it the Karabasan, or the Dark Presser, which I think would make a fantastic name for an 80s metal band. <laughs> um, then, if you were in Mexico, they'd call it the Semi Subio El Muerto, or a dead body climbed on top of me, usually an infant, believe it or not, which makes it extra scary. If you were in Wales, in a particular area, and this is actually associated with one particular castle, you would be visited by the dribbling hag, and by dribbling, like drooling, and she has very long nails and could paralyze you. Scary stuff. So let's talk a bit about the paranormal features in sleep paralysis. While I get a little coffee. <coughs> Well, for one, sleep paralysis, not surprisingly, usually happens at night. Uh, the night's a very mysterious time. And we seem to have sort of, we're evolutionarily hardwired to be afraid of the dark. 
Uh, psychologist Randolph Ness did some studies on this, and our fear of the dark doesn't seem to be um, just due to modeling or learning. There seems to be something that we're bequeathed through our evolutionary history to be afraid of the dark. And as I said, during sleep paralysis, you are awake, but you are completely helpless. You couldn't move or utter a sound to even get help during one of these episodes. So you're completely helpless. And the inability to breathe properly makes it even scarier. So you start feeling like you're suffocating a bit, which creates a vicious feedback cycle. The hallucinations are very common. They occur about 80 or 85 or 90% of the time you experience hallucinations during sleep paralysis episodes. And they are just as vivid and real as I am to you right now. So you're able to look around the room, you can see your bedroom, and you're seeing things that are scary that aren't there. Um, you're oftentimes seeing hallucinations of other beings, and the majority of the time it's a non-human being that you're seeing, as we'll see. And you're experience, you can experience hallucinations in any of the sensory modalities. You can smell things, you can hear things. And in contrast to normal dreaming, how often do you think normal dreams are scary, if you had to guess? What percent of the time? 10%, 80%. Uh, it's about 30% of the time you have a scary normal dream. With sleep paralysis, it's about 90% of the time. How long does it last, though, these episodes? The mean amount of time, and this is all based on subjective report, is six minutes. But I've heard of a half hour, so you can imagine that'd be pretty terrifying. How does it come on and leave? So subjectively, how does it come on and, and then leave? You you snap out of it at the end? Yeah, as soon as you um, are able to move again, the hallucinations disappear. And that plays into the mythology, which I'll get to in a minute. <clears throat> so again, let's talk a little bit about how sleep paralysis might contribute to folklore and mythology. To be fair, we don't really know the chain of causality quite yet. So do you believe in strange things because you have these anomalous experiences? Or do you have these anomalous, anomalous experiences because you already believe in strange things? We don't quite know yet. But again, it seems to play at least a part in the genesis, the maintenance, or the elaboration of these beliefs in paranormal entities, um, paranormal attacks. So let's start out with demons. Fun topic for a Saturday, right? So incubi and succubi are most related to to sleep paralysis. So these, um, Roman Catholic Church talked a lot about these in the Middle Ages. The incubi were male demons, succubi were female demons, and they were very libidinal. They'd attack you, sexually assault you. Um, these were not nice entities. And the root for incubus comes from incubare, which means to lie down upon. Remember that picture of Fuseli's painting The Nightmare? So something lying down on top of you. And the attacks of an incubus or succubus could lead to nocturnal emission. They could lead to anxiety and exhaustion. And it's hard for us to wrap our minds around what it would have been like to be alive in this time period. It wasn't just like the uneducated peasants believed in demons. Um, the learned elite believed in them as well. They wrote fantastically written books, the Malleus Maleficarum, the Compendium Maleficarum, where they would have very learned discussions about whether incubi could impregnate human women. Um, my favorite discussion is probably um, whether or not witches could actually steal penises. And then if they could steal the penises, where they put them? Turns out they put them in golden bird cages, of all things. Who would have guessed? <laughs> um, but, but so it's not like just peasants were talking about these things. And if you look at the descriptions of the demonic visitations, they include things that are very consistent with the phenomenon of sleep paralysis. So you have a sensed, seen, or felt presence in the room with you. Feelings of pressure on the chest or the body, which then goes on to a nocturnal attack. And what's interesting, if you read the first-hand accounts, they talk about the strange and unnatural coldness of these demons. So we normally think about demons and hellfire, but if you look at the descriptions, they were described as very cold, especially the genitals. And in research I've done, sensations of cold during sleep paralysis are actually very common. And this will get to your point, um, the, the question you asked a little bit ago. But the demons, just like vampires and witches, would immediately disappear upon cock's crow. So when daylight arises, rooster, makes his noise, they disappear in an instant, just like that. And that's also consistent, because I said, when movement comes back, the hallucinations magically go away. So now let's talk about vampires. 
And there's a picture of me before my parents gave me braces. Um, but there's been a long-standing belief uh, that humans can survive death in some way, right? And I, I, a lot of, of the skeptics in the room here, myself included, believe that th this belief is driven by all two human values. How many of us wouldn't want to see our grandparents again? I mean, who wouldn't want to see people that you've loved and lost in the past? Um, but as, just as a post-death existence can allow us to have some sort of connection, a nice um, continuing relationship, it also gives us the possibility to be tormented by others. Um, and that's where vampires come along. A vampire is a subtype of revenant. This derives from reven, I can't pronounce that, revenience. I'm, I'm terrible at Latin, but this means returning. So this is a returning being. Um, I'm going to make a little deviation just because I think vampirism is so fascinating. But there are a lot of reasons other than sleep paralysis why we believe in vampirism and why, why a lot of people through the ages have. One of the biggest reasons is just not understanding natural decay processes in the body. So you can imagine if you bury a corpse and then you dig it up a few weeks later and you're thinking about staking it and you actually drive a stake through it, there's a buildup of natural decay gases which could cause bodily fluids to spurt out almost like it's still alive and could cause air to travel through the vocal cords so you have a corpse that seems to be moaning, seemingly in pain. You also, back in the day before contemporary embalming, you'd bury people alive a lot. This was very common. Believe it or not, in Vienna, they, they, they were thinking about doing a system of bells so that you could ring if you were mistakenly buried alive. So you can imagine waking up in a casket and you don't know what's going on. You're scraping around trying to get out until your oxygen's completely gone and then you're dead. And then somebody digs you up and sees you contorted in pain and sees scratch marks. It would seem like you might be a vampire. You might be something that's trying to get out and attack the living. Uh, one of the best explanations which um, I, I've heard and, and which uh, I, can't, I think, I can't remember the, the scholar that did this, but tuberculosis. So tuberculosis causes a lot of sleep disturbances, so it makes sleep paralysis more likely. But you also cough up a lot of blood while you're sleeping. So you can imagine if you're actually having lots of sleep disturbances, you have one of these episodes of sleep paralysis where you're being attacked by something, and then you wake up and find blood on your sheets. How would you explain this? <coughs> But in terms of some more connections between sleep paralysis and vampirism, again, the you're oftentimes attacked at night. The uh, Hollywood European vampire can't go out in daylight, but that's not the case for a lot of the other vampires. Um, but the victim is typically attacked in bed. Um, interestingly, if you look at some of the real um, European descriptions of uh, where they actually dug up corpses for real, the vampires were recently deceased relatives. So if you look at the Mercy Brown case in Rhode Island, Mercy Brown died of tuberculosis, and then she was seen by her family members attacking them at night. Um, and I have some data that I'm going to show that you actually do. It's very common to see a recently deceased relative during sleep paralysis. Then you've got the feelings of being attacked, being, being throttled, being attacked by the vampire. There's a strong sexual component to vampirism. Hollywood totally plays this up. Um, clearly, not all vampires in history look like Brad Pitt, but I'm sure even Bella Lugosi had a pretty full dance card. Um, there's always this sexual um, blending of vampire folklore. And um, it also involved paralysis. You see, even see these in those terrible tw um, you know, TV shows about vampires, where you, where you can be glamored by a vampire. They can paralyze you. So here's a, a line from Montague Summers. The vampire is generally believed to embrace his victim who has been thrown into a trance-like sleep. Now let's talk about witches. So here's a picture of the editor of The Skeptic, Deborah Hyde is a witch, if any of you know her. Um, as I said, sleep paralysis is probably most associated with witches and witchcraft. And again, it's hard for us really, 21st century folks, but a non-belief in witchcraft is a pretty recent historical occurrence, really. It just is. But the influence is still with us. Our word haggard derives from Old English, hag rid, which means ridden by the hag. So uh, in, if you go back to the south, 
um, in some African Americans' descriptions of their sleep paralysis experience, they call it the witch riding you. Okay? So hag rid, ridden by the hag. Witches, again, are often associated with night. They're usually flying around, going to their covens at night. They could enter rooms and appear, disappear at will, very suddenly, remember? Cessation of the paralysis, hallucinations go away too. They could paralyze the limbs, the earliest accounts um, talked about that. They could levitate and fly, so they could do things that are very um, in line with hallucinations. They could generate strange lights, so uh, they could make you see things like will-o'-the-wisps. And if you look at the narratives of sleep paralysis people, they oftentimes will talk about these strange lights that they see that are just go away. And finally, as this woodcut would show, they could influence people and objects. So here a little boy is being levitated by some witches. And one of the main subtypes of sleep paralysis hallucination is feeling that your body is being moved without your volition. So you're being levitated, you might be moving around the room. All right, let's talk about alien abductions. So I'm not against the idea that there could be a life on other planets. And um, I, I, if I had to guess, a lot of people in here wouldn't be against that idea, in theory. Um, and this goes back at least to Democritus, who speculated on life in other planets and how this could be a distinct possibility. Um, this, what I'm going to show you might shock you. So a 2002 Roper poll, about 67% of people in the US, and it was a fairly large sample, believe in the possibility of alien life. That's not that surprising. 48% believe that UFOs have visited. 12% say they or someone they know saw a UFO at close range. So this is a belief that's, that's really with us. And the European studies I've, I've seen are, are very similar. So there's another poll done in um, Britain. And a high percentage of those folks believe that the government was actually covering up the existence of UFOs. <coughs> And unfortunately, for people who believe in UFOs and alien abductions, a lot of them tend to seek out hypnotists to try and, and um, get more clarity on their memories. But unfortunately, as a lot of you probably know, hypnosis isn't the best for getting really good memories. And, and if it's not done very, very carefully, it could actually create and instill false memories that feel just as real as real memories. So this is unfortunate um, that this happens. But there seem to be pretty good connections with sleep paralysis in these episodes. The nocturnal alien reductions, not surprisingly, happen at night. They involve being immobile. So you oftentimes hear people being on a table and being unable to move and hearing strange things, having illusory body movements, being levitated vertically or horizontally, almost like a tractor beam involve hearing and seeing strange things. You're seeing these gray aliens with big eyes that are muttering in a language you can't understand. And you guys all know about the probings. So a, a, a good part of the alien mythology since the, the, at least going back as far as the Betty and Barney Hill case, involve these, they have these sexual elements. So pain and um, probing, sexual intrusions. Interestingly, you guys might be surprised by this, but there have been studies of people who believe they were abducted by aliens, <coughs> and you compare them to people who haven't, don't believe they were abducted by aliens. They're actually no more likely to have a major mental illness. It's not like all of these folks have schizophrenia. That's a big myth. Um, but they do differ in other more subtle ways. So it seems like people that believe they were abducted by aliens have higher levels of dissociation. They're also a bit easier to hypnotize. They also, in certain laboratory experiments, seem to be a little bit more likely to create false memories. Um, but surprisingly, there's not a whole lot of difference. Use the word dissociation yes. Can you define it? Yes, that's where you have a, an experience that's split off from from others. Yeah. And they seem to have, um, all of you have little bits of dissociation throughout your day. So if you're driving along 270, and all of a sudden you kind of zone out and then you wake up a couple miles down the road and you're like, wow, what just happened? That's an experience of dissociation. Um, but yeah, so they have a little bit more of, of those things and they have more fantasy proneness. So they have very rich fantasy lives compared to people that aren't abducted by UFOs. 
Do most people depict aliens on the previous slides, you know, kind of the big... Like the greys? Uh, um, yeah, yeah they're all over the place, but, yeah. but there, there's a high percentage that see the classic grey figure, very slight, grey style body, giant head, big eyes. Uh, I, I, I think Hollywood certainly helps. <laughs> yeah, something, yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. Do the people who think that they're abducted, do they have more tendency to have sleep paralysis? I'm, I, they, there's some data on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Susan Clancy and Richard McNally at Harvard um, did, did studies of, of people with, that believe they were abducted, and they, a lot of them reported sleep paralysis. Absolutely. You might not be shocked by this, but there are several prominent uh, scientists and scholars who have come out on the pro side of alien abduction. So anybody ever hear John Mack? Yeah. Okay, John Mack, for those of you who don't know, was a Pulitzer Prize winning author, also head of Harvard's psychiatry department. Really smart guy. And he started interviewing and hip, do, using hypnosis on people who believed they were abductees. He was a bit cagey about whether he really believed it, but most people that, that have read his stuff think that he believed it. And as I said, abductees tend to endorse sleep paralysis quite a bit. <clears throat> but before we had aliens, fairies would actually take you away. So you would be kidnapped by fairies, and you'd think they stole you out of your bed, and then you woke up in your bed the next day. What's really weird is when I was researching um, my book on sleep paralysis, a lot of the preventatives that people do today to try and keep aliens away are the exact same things they used to do with fairies. And I doubt the people have read a lot of the fairy lore, because who reads about fairy lore other than me? But um, so it's very strange, but they use things like salt and iron, which are all things that they thought would keep away fairies and would keep away aliens. Now let's talk about ghosts and shadow people. So what the hell are shadow people? So um, there's two main theories for what shadow people are. The first is that they're, they're time travelers. The second is that they're interdimensional beings. And for some reason, they can't quite fully materialize on our planes. So all we can see are these wispy, shadowy outlines of them. They're oftentimes depicted with red eyes, um, like the figure there. They sometimes have hats, like Indiana Jones. Um, but you might be surprised that Stephen Hawking is not completely averse to the possibility of shadow people. He's actually written that, yeah, it, sure, could happen. So what are their characteristics? Seen at night, they're indistinct, they're fuzzy. <coughs> they're these shadowy, amorphous figures that you usually see in your peripheral vision. So if you're lying there paralyzed and you can move your eyes, you can just barely make them out. The descriptions actually sound a lot like the old European werewolf stories which were, you guys might be surprised, but they were seen as fairly amorphous that could come in through a mist through the drain pipes and materialize in the bedroom. What seems to be a little new about them um, is that they're not all bad. They're not all scary. Their motivations seem to be just as individualized as any of our motivations in here. So you have some neutral shadow people, you have some evil shadow people. I haven't heard a lot of good ones, but I assume they're probably out there. <clears throat> but what seems interesting to me is this seems like a contemporary refiguration of the old myths. So, you know, it might seem a little passe for us to believe that we're being visited by witches or aliens, but technolo I mean, witches or demons, but technologically advanced aliens, interdimensional beings that might have radically different technology than ours, maybe that's a little easier to swallow. All right, now I'm gonna talk about a little bit of the data. I didn't wanna make this uh, too data heavy uh, of a talk, but you guys might be wondering how common sleep paralysis is. I wondered that too when I started studying it, looking at the individual studies that were out there, the prevalence rates were all over the place. So what I did, I took a study I did and I aggregated it with 34 others. And we had a priori selection criteria to make sure we were actually seeing sleep paralysis and not closely related symptoms. Had a total combined end in the study pretty close to the population of Annapolis, so that was pretty good. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't discriminate between sleep paralysis and isolated sleep paralysis because a lot of the studies didn't rule out narcolepsy, but narcolepsy is very, very rare. So I assume the, b the bulk of the data is going to be applicable to isolated sleep paralysis. And we were actually able to break it out into specific groups for very specific prevalence rates. I found these results very surprising. I, I wonder how you guys will think about them. 
<clears throat> so if we're looking in terms of the general population, almost 8% of people reported having sleep paralysis at least once in their life. So again, doesn't mean they're having it as a problem or in a, in a really chronic way, but have had it at least once. If we're looking at ungraduate students, rises to 28%, pretty high. Um, psychiatric patients, almost 32%, with the highest rates being in psychiatric patients with panic disorder. Um, so this being the case, I'm guessing some people probably in the room have experienced sleep paralysis. <coughs> Yeah, so you don't need to feel that this is weird or crazy or <laughs> carefully. So if we look in terms of uh, prevalence rates according to gender, not much of a difference. Uh, women have it slightly more than men, but I don't think that's, that's very huge. Previously, when I started studying this, there was a bit of clinical lore that sleep paralysis might be much more prevalent in non-whites, and it might actually be an African-American variant of panic disorder, but if you look at the data, this is clearly not the case. And in terms of, this is the students. It seems like Asians had it a, a bit more than uh, folks of African descent, Hispanics, or whites, but these differences are not massive. I was quite surprised that we were all so close together on this. All right. So being a clinical psychologist, I'm interested in how strange experiences affect people. So you might be wondering, is it ever a problem? It is for Kendall Jenner, believe it or not. She came out a few months ago <laughs> talking about how she has it all the time. And it's so scary to her that she doesn't want to go and do her modeling gigs and uh, you know, fly all over the world because she has these experiences so far. You know, the British people are the royal family. We just have the Kardashians, so that's just, it's just what we have. Um, but, uh, and I've, I've never met Kendall Jenner, so I don't know a lot about her. Um, but I would imagine that flying around, being jet lagged a lot, if she drinks at all, all these things are, are uh, proximal causative mechanisms for sleep paralysis that'll make it more likely to occur but it causes her a problem. But I was interested in this more systematic data. So I've done two studies on this. One with a sample of people that had panic attacks, a clinical sample, and one, a, two, a very large two-site study of 185 st uh, students, one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast. All of them had sleep paralysis. So of those, 43.6% of the clinical sample had sleep paralysis to, at such a frequency and to such an extent that it actually caused them problems. So it met the criteria for a disorder of a recurrent isolated sleep paralysis. This was quite a bit less for the student sample and only about 15% of them had it to the extent that it was a problem. But um, I, I, I was, I, I did not think either sample would be this high to be, to be honest. Isn't your number very low too? For the clinical sample, yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, so that was from a sample of 133 uh, patients with panic attacks, and 27 of them had sleep paralysis. And of those 27, those are what we got, yeah. And just to let you know, the, these, these folks didn't complete surveys, but they conducted in-person, face-to-face, 20-minute, semi-structured clinical interviews so that you can make sure they actually had sleep paralysis and weren't thinking that it was something else. So it is a problem for some people. And the problem is, a lot of people don't talk about it because they think they're going crazy or they think you're gonna judge them negatively. You know, I woke up and had something on my chest and it magically went away or I was abducted by aliens. Who are you gonna tell that to? So I can't tell you the number of people I've interviewed. They said, people actually have this too? I'm not the only one? So um, yeah, but for some of them, it's a real problem. You might be wondering, just reading between the lines of some of the things we've talked about, do people actually misconstrue these sleep paralysis hallucinations as actual assaults, where they think they actually happened as opposed to just experiencing some wonky sleep state? You could s clearly see the possibility. And just like anything else, um, reality testing is normally distributed in the population. So some people have really good reality testing, some people have poor reality <coughs> testing. And so some people might be able to be more likely to believe that these things might have actually happened. There's a tiny bit of literature documenting this if you look at the narcolepsy lit. Um, so some people that have narcolepsy have thought actual attacks had occurred. And there was at least one legal case in the US that I was involved in in Florida. I want to show you guys one interesting historical vignette that is in line with this as well. 
<clears throat> so I'll read this to you. I was going to bed. About the dead of night, I felt a great weight upon my breast. An awakening looked, and a bringing bright moonlight did clearly see Bridget Bishop, or her likeness, sitting upon my stomach. She laid hold of my throat and almost choked me. I had no strength or power in my hands to resist or help myself. John Lunders, 1692. Anybody want to guess where I got this? Salem. Salem Witch Trials. Anybody want to guess what happened to Bridget Bishop next? <laughs> she was the first person hanged, actually. Um, and there were, I believe, two other pieces of, of testimony that were consistent with sleep paralysis episodes. So, um, very interesting, huh? So there's the nightmare according to Winnie the Pooh. So I'll, I'll give, show you guys just a little bit of data I've collected about the typical symptoms and hallucinations that people experience during sleep paralysis. <clears throat> so here's a little chart from my 2010 study. And in the middle is a zero to eight scale of fear where four and above is clinically significant. Um, and then this is the percentage of the sample that actually had it. Um, this is the first study. I, I just submitted the second one, so I'll just show these for now. But trying to speak but not being able to seems to be subjectively experienced as the scariest. Feeling that, like you might die is right under that. Um, feeling cold, like I talked about. Erotic sensations aren't that scary, but we had a couple male patients that kind of liked them. They kind of liked having, interacting with the hallucinations. Um, but in general, these things are fairly scary. The, ex the experiences and the things that go into them are fairly scary. Now, if we're talking in terms of specifically the, the hallucinations of others, this is from the sample of 185 students. Almost 58% of people sensed another presence in the room with them. So imagine that. You're paralyzed. You can't move. You're able to look around the room, and you sense something's there, like almost like you're walking around one of the more dangerous neighborhoods in DC, and you feel like eyes are on you. But you're not predator in this scenario. You're prey. Very scary. And you can see it reflected in the, the, the fear of So. Like I said, 58% of people sense a presence in the room. Almost 25% actually see a non-human being in the room with them during these episodes. And this is associated with the highest levels of fear. Um, six is, very, is severe levels of fear. Um, so they're almost that. And then just about 22% see a person in the room with them. Okay. Now in terms of the sense presence, uh, the majority of people that you asked they believe that it's non-human. So they think there's something non-human in there with them. Only 40% thought it was another person. I found this just absolutely fascinating. So this is um, data about what people are actually seeing in terms of non-human beings. Look at number one, shadow people. Shadow people, then ghosts. But if we think about the classic things, the demons, the, the aliens, the vampires, witches aren't even up there. So it seems to me this might imply that there's a little bit of shift in the dominant narratives used to explain these well, sleep paralysis episodes. No. It was, open. It, it was open, open response, yeah. Because I, di I didn't want to lead them. So we just asked them, you know, what do you think, what do you think they are if they endorse them? Um, so 35% shadow people. Are these cultural in any way that is do Americans see Different yes. Like mentioned in Zanzibar, they mostly a giant bat in China. Yeah, uh, it seems to be they do seem to have a high cultural loading. And so this was actually a pretty diverse sample. I didn't show up the demographic data, but it was much more diverse. It wasn't just a bunch of, of uh, Caucasian undergrads um, that were part of this. <clears throat> but yeah, I found that absolutely fascinating. Now, in terms of human beings, 60% of people saw strangers. So they didn't know these people that they were seeing. 40% of them knew them. What I found even more startling, though, when, when I looked at the data a bit more closely, thir about 32% of the people that saw someone they knew, they, they saw, they hallucinated a recently deceased relative. So again, keep in mind, these are college kids, so they might be going through their first experience with death. And they would report that they had their first sleep paralysis episode very shortly after the, their experience of death. So you can imagine seeing someone that you love who died recently and who is saying or doing very scary things to you. Um, again, which I found very consistent with a lot of the old stories of vampires, Mercy Brown, etc. 
so being a clinical psychologist, again, I was curious, OK, so now we found out this thing isn't, isn't that uncommon. We found out that a, a, a proportion of these folks are actually having problems with it. Is there a way to actually treat it? I'm going to say a definitive yes, sort of. We really don't know. Um, not surprisingly, there's not a lot of research funding for this. Um, NIH, this isn't the top of their priority list. If any of you want to give me money, I'd be more than happy to do a, a randomized control trial. But we just haven't had any yet. Um, there are lots of old medical treatments. And again, they follow logically from the theory of how sleep paralysis slash the nightmare are caused. So we talked about pH imbalances. So make the patient drink ammonia or make them drink vinegar. Get the pH back in line. The humoral theory, there's too much blood. Well, there's nothing that can't be cured by a good bleeding. So venesection, that's a good one. This one kills me. Macedonian parsley. <laughs> Apparently not European parsley. It has to be Macedonian. I don't know why. But something special about Macedonian parsley. And there are also lots of fun folk treatments. There's a whole chapter in the book about this. I wish I could take you through them all. They're hysterical. I'll just take you through some of them. You would be shocked to find vampires, witches, um, and nightmares, the Mara, they're all riddled with obsessive compulsive disorder. So if you want to protect yourself, you just take a handful of rice or a handful of millet, throw it outside your bedroom. And so when they come to attack you, they can't come to attack you until they count every single grain. <laughs> so very easy, very easy to protect yourself. And that's cheap. That's cheap. <laughs> very similar if you want to protect yourself from witches. Witches have always been linked with brooms. If you put a broom, um, outside or in, in the entrance way to your door, they can't attack you until they count every, br every little bristle. So make sure you don't use a Swiffer, because that's very easy to count. So you have to use a real old school broom. Horseshoes. Again, there's, some, there's a strange connection with horses. Nightmare. But putting up horseshoes was supposed to ward off certain of these demonic entities. Salt. Uh, I'll gross you out a little bit with this one, but <laughs> if you want to protect yourself from the Mara in Eastern Europe, what they used to do was they'd lay a towel over themselves before they'd go to sleep that was streaked with human feces. <laughs> so it wouldn't want to attack you, and apparently they don't want you dating ever either. <laughs> um, but use, they'd also, um, another one I read about was they would um, smoke milk, um, like, like they'd, uh, they'd Put, impart the flavor of smoke into milk and put that around the bedroom so that you wouldn't, um, it would keep things away. If you were an Inuit, you'd sleep with an ulu on your chest. You ever see an ulu? It's a curved blade. It's really good for chopping vegetables. Or you might put a, a piece of wood on your chest with a knife stuck in it so that if, if the witch ever came to attack you, once you could get your hand out, you could, you could defend yourself. So we don't use a lot of those treatments anymore. But here are some of the pharmacological options. So there are at least um, very small numbers of patients have been treated with this. And some of them do appear promising. So if we look at the antidepressants, the old school tricyclics, the new SSRI, selective serotonin, reuptake inhibitors, uh, they do seem to be fairly promising. And we think this is because they end up suppressing REM activity. That's one of the side effects which, if you're trying to sleep treat sleep paralysis, you would actually um, prescribe a patient this. Um, you wouldn't want to use uh, velazaxine or merprotoline. Um, they don't seem to do much. And this one actually makes it uh, a little worse. So it made people have more sleep paralysis. GHB, strangely enough, this probably has the most evidence in favor of its efficacy for sleep paralysis because they use this. This is also the, the, one of the date rape drugs. So it's unfortunately used like that. But they've tested it in a few different trials with patients with narcolepsy. And one of the things that it does is reduce sleep paralysis episodes. It's also used for uh, mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah. That's the, the fascinating thing about these drugs. They, they use them all, all sorts of things. And yeah. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the pharmacological options. Um, and there weren't any 
psychological treatment. So um, what I did in the last study that I talked about with all the undergrads, I started asking them what they actually did to get out of it or to prevent these episodes. I collected that data and I put it together with some of the typical things you do to treat insomnia and came up with some new things and created uh, a new treatment for this, which is being tested right now in Arlington. So if anybody knows anybody that has sleep paralysis where it's really problematic, causing them problems, feel free to shoot me an email. But so this is a manualized treatment with an adherence manual so that you can actually see if it's being done properly. And I'm piloting this right now. So if this is effective, it would be another potential tool people could use to treat <coughs> sleep paralysis. Um, so in conclusion, I think we all have a human need to make sense of strange things. And how do, how do we do this? Well, we're, we're limited by the categories we have. So if you're a scientific person, you use science to explain things. So you might do research into figuring out how sleep paralysis is caused, some of the things you can do to prevent it. Um, if you're a believer in demons, you might think demons are causing it. If you're a believer in UFOs, you might think that, well, the most rational explanation is you're being abducted by aliens. So we have to try to make sense of these strange experiences. And anything that goes on d during sleep, I study a few other weird sleep disorders, anything that seems to even remotely touch sleep seems to get really, people really upset and can be very frightening, very disturbing. And I think in general, scientific education about these disorders um, and doing research on them could potentially help, not only relieve suffering in the people who might be ashamed or feel scared or think that they have something seriously wrong with them because of sleep paralysis, which is really harmless, um, but it also could uh, help eliminate some of those dysfunctional beliefs in the paranormal that really, I don't think, help people a lot. Um, so in closing, I'd like to make a shameless plug for, uh, mm -hmm. for two books. Mm -hmm. um, they're both out through Oxford University Press, and I have some discount catalogs. So you can get 30% off if you wanted to order them. The first one we go through, my colleague Carl de Gramji and I go through all the history, we get into all the mythology of the experience, then we synthesize all the data, and then we end with the treatment manual. So it's actually readable even if you're not interested in psychology and neurology and that stuff, it's readable. This just came out a couple months ago. I, I love this book, uh, The Unusual and Rare Psychological Disorders. It goes through, there's a chapter on sleep paralysis, but you can learn about exploding head syndrome. You can learn about persistent genital arousal disorder. You can learn about Cotard syndrome, which is the delusion that you're a walking corpse. So many interesting things that out there that, that don't get a lot of either popular attention or scientific attention. So. Um, Thank you all for coming to my talk and I'm um